my experience has been actually the homesteading and, and for me a, a rural life has not f- well maybe forced community is one word uh you know when we you and i have to explain to gabino why the pigs that kind of belong to us but we're actually at shannon's house knocked right. over his trash and rum- did your dogs rummage through my trash no it's my pigs but those were shannon's pigs well they're at shannon's but they're mine and craig's Welcome back to uh, the Till and Keep podcast. My name is Jason Craig. Uh, if you've been a listener for any time, which can't be that long because we just started this podcast, you know uh, that we're discussing uh, the intersection of things, which again is what all podcasts claim to be doing. Specifically for us, it's all the things that cross paths, especially in the life of a father, uh, which is culture, economics, uh, finance, uh, the practicalities of work, running a household, ordering a household, leading a household, leaving, returning, uh, all of those things, they, they cross paths, especially in a father's life. Uh, you know, academics have a big debate about whether culture is upstream of politics or politics upstream or downstream of culture. And what I've come to realize is that whoever's right, the father is downstream of all of it. He uh, picks up all the trash, all the goodness, all the problems. Uh, and that's what uh, this podcast is about. It's about tilling and keeping. Uh, if you've missed some of the other ones, you know, that comes from the book of Genesis, where us men, one of the predominant realities of our life is that we have to work and that we get to work. Uh, and depending on how you view that is whether you get to or you have to. Um, but when we till is when we work. That's part of the command uh, to work the garden. The garden was not created by Adam. So when he was told to till the garden, he was also told to keep it. Uh, which we can interpret as um, maintaining the integrity and the nature of the garden itself um, so that when we work, we also don't destroy. And uh, some of us don't have an easy time actually believing uh, that we can work, that we can progress, that we can grow uh, without having to destroy or leave behind something else. Uh, And in that discussion, uh, it seems that a lot of fathers, a lot of families have an agrarian moment at one point. Uh, specifically, they want to <clears throat> someone at, at some point, whether the, the husband or the wife, they say, as, particularly after they have a couple of kids, maybe they say, wouldn't it be great if we could just go live on a farm? Wouldn't it be great if we could live differently, if we could live more simply, if we could enjoy the fruits of our labor, if we could work with one another? I think every family goes through that at some point um, and has that what I like to call the, the agrarian moment. Uh, today on uh, the Till and Keep podcast, I have my friend Craig Tafaro. Craig and I met um, through Fraternus, possibly we're both yeah. still a part of. Uh, Craig was doing some writing for Fraternus, and I don't remember what it was, uh, but I picked up that he seemed to be very just perceptive to truth. Just I liked it. I liked what you were writing. Uh, we met at a couple I think of. He told me you have a very simple and homely style. Simple and homely. He remembers <laughs> it. He's actually got it on a t shirt. All right. Craig Tafaro, simple and homely. Um, he, um, and I've gotten to know him more because we we saw you at a couple of events. You did we we did an event in Bostic. You were there, and then I think we really picked up steam. Uh, we do some uh, workshops on our farm uh, that are m- mildly organized, and you came to one. We were killing a pig. We killed two pigs. We killed two pigs with Jim Curley. If you guys recall, uh, was on this podcast. We talked about pig killing. I think Craig has actually joined. Uh, if anything, I have a cult here. And it, it's a cult following, not of me, but of Jim Curley. Uh, there, there are <laughs> two types of people in the world, people that know Jim Curley and people that don't. Um, so uh, Jim was on the podcast before. Yeah. And uh, so Craig went to one of those um, workshops where we killed two pigs. We, we uh, ate, one of them. ate one of them, butchered the other one, cured some hams. <laughs> Drink some beer. Drink some beer. Yes. Um, and I think it was, was it there? We had the conversation. I said, well, there's some land across the street. It is. Okay. And um, it was an open invitation to anyone there. That's right. <laughs> so <laughs> by the land, by the land. Yeah. There was, there's uh, 13 acres or 14 or what's yeah, it? You 13, probably know 14 somewhere there. between 13 and 16, um, right across the street from my house. In fact, um, there's a tunnel connecting the properties. Uh, so I, I tell you, I have an underground tunnel to another Catholic farm. Uh, but um, 
I, I was often telling people, hey, that land's across the street because I knew that it was not on the market, but it was potentially available because the family was um, considering, you know, the, the, the owners of it, I could tell were inching towards okay. and that could become anything across right. the street. Um, so a lot of people feigned interest. And before I knew it, though, uh, Craig was putting offers down. I, I mean, you were I didn't even know how fast it was going for you. Um, but as some, and I'm gonna allow you to fill in the gaps because I actually mm-hmm. don't know some of these things. Um, the reason it made sense for you is you were actually you were living in the city in Charlotte, mm-hmm. but you were already homesteading significantly more. And and the way I knew that maybe this guy could actually make it is I think your wife had showed up. I don't know if it was the pig workshop or maybe this was later one of the homestead workshops. First mm-hmm. time at Abby, she wasn't wife. allowed at the pig workshop. That's right, men only. only. That's right. That's why there's so much beer. Um, but one of the later ones, but my experience of you was the same, which was, I, I asked her, is he always like this? Uh, cause he was just wide open helping with scalding the pig and getting everything ready. And, uh, oh, man, I think, I think this guy's got it. Um, so tell me when, uh, so that's the short story. You were homesteading. I want you to fill in some gaps on, on how you got to that in Charlotte, why mm-hmm. that happened and then where you are now. So back me up, mm-hmm. tell me about you are. From Louisiana, but the way you ended up in North Carolina is Belmont Abbey College, and, which is a small liberal arts Catholic college with a Benedictine monastery on campus, just right. outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, and what did you and study? I studied political philosophy and literature um, in the context of the honors program, which was a a great books program in the Catholic liberal arts tradition. Okay, and I was all over the place with college ideas and and uh, where I wanted to go, and what I wanted to do. I had everything from uh, the Air Force Academy and studying aerospace engineering okay. to music school uh, for classical and jazz guitar. Wait, these are things you were considering after Belmont? To, uh, at to the do same time. At the same time. Yeah, and okay. so when I was in high school looking at college options, I was all over the place. Okay. And I think... Uh, I can see it very clearly now through divine providence. Belmont Abbey was the place that came out on top for me, um, in large part due to a visit there and the time with the monks mm. and the the peace that I felt on campus there all came together. And there was a nice scholarship too. Nice. Okay. It financially, scholarships work, people. And then, uh, and then I stayed in North Carolina. I thought for sure I was going back to Louisiana. You know, why wouldn't I? Right. It's uh, the place with the most culture in the entire great American states. Catholic culture. That's even. right. Uh, but I I met a, a young lady who I wanted to be my wife. And as I was another Abby, graduation, another Abby. I yes. met Abby at the Abbey. Yes. Mm-hmm. And she is now my wife, and has been so for just about nine years. And uh, she kept me in North Carolina. Wow. So. Okay. So <clears throat> after college, then you decided to stay. She, her parent, her folks are in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. By the way, I think that's the norm. We because that is pretty normal. The reason I'm asking is my oldest. You know her, Margaret Mary. She's 14. She's starting to, have, you know, a, very much appear as a woman and thoughts of marriage and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I keep thinking, but it's, we're okay because they usually settle near. The, the the lady yeah but, okay i think so i hope that's the it's going to be here though <laughs> now that the you've set the custom um but after school what'd you do for work or when did you guys get married when you were in school we got no we got married uh, about a year after we graduated okay so Ab- abby lived with her parents and uh, worked in various jobs kind of filling the time between graduating and marrying me okay um and I worked in financial services. You guys were all expecting that on the podcast, right? Yeah. This liberal arts guy, and he's going to end up in, in banking. So I worked uh, in a, a, a very large mutual fund company. How, hold on. How did that happen? How did you go from the school? That didn't seem like the next step. So what was it? Were you just looking for an efficient? I, I just needed a job to pay my student loans okay. and, and live. Okay. And exactly why did you know someone or no no i didn't know anyone there i knew no one that worked there 
I had never heard of this company. The reason I'm asking this, in case you guys are wondering, is uh, you know, Craig's sitting next. To, I'm keep we, we have to we're we're sharing a microphone, but I'm also keeping my distance because there's blood and guts all over his leg. From I, he was late for this podcast, I had to go pick him up, uh, and there was a steer hanging. Craig is now a butcher, just to cross the street from it, but I don't want to get there yet. Uh, so this is why it's intriguing as to uh, how and why he got into uh, finance. Yeah, I I just looked for a job. And I applied to some business consulting jobs. I applied to some finance. And just like American degree. college students American are going to start consulting. Students, yeah. Who are you going to consult? I don't know. Figured maybe they pay me something. To do. <laughs> I got ideas. <laughs> I didn't think I had ideas. I just I thought needed I could a job. Do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've been doing that for four years. So. All right. Anyway, see, so yeah, I, I, uh, for anyone familiar with the financial services industry, I got my Series 7 and 63 uh, FINRA licenses. I got my Certified Financial Planner designation a few years later. Um, worked as a personal financial advisor, helping people manage retirement funds. Okay. Uh, I, I worked with about, by the time I was leaving there, I worked with about 200 households. Okay. And they had anywhere from one to ten million dollars invested with them. Is it common in the industry to call it households? Fairly common. Okay. Yeah. Um all right, but at some point you um began and I actually I don't know the answer to this. Mm -hmm. I know some of this, but you began homesteading in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Why and how did that happen? So uh, we started we started on our apartment porch. Nice. Uh, yeah, when we first got married, we were in an apartment for a couple of years. And then as soon as we bought our house, we just kind of went wide open. We had a yard. We could suddenly do all these things that I had maybe, I think, more me than Abby originally had dreamed of doing. Um, she didn't take much convincing, but mm. a little bit when we got our first flock of... A little convincing? Layers. A little convincing, yeah. yeah. But she jumped right in. We were uh, started small. Well, why? Why was why? it just? Yeah, I had grown up gardening. Um, first garden I had was when I was seven, and I begged my parents to give me a plot of the yard that I could turn into a vegetable garden, and they said, "Sure, go for it." And so I grew. I don't know, cucumbers and tomatoes and cauliflower and broccoli. And Separate from the family? Strawberries. Part? My family did not garden. Oh, so you grew up gardening in your garden? My garden. So you originated this yeah, I originated in your family? That. Okay. My One of my grandmothers liked to garden primarily uh, roses and other ornamentals. And she started doing a little vegetable gardening. I'd help her in her vegetable garden. And then in high school, I worked um, with a family at our church who, I think it was their full-time business, but it was a side business that they grew tomatoes and <laughs> maybe peppers. I think it was mostly just tomatoes and peppers. Every year they sold it at a roadside stand. I go work in their field and wow, I just I was attracted to it from, from the, the young from age. the start. Mm -hmm. Was there a while you're well you're um. You're in banking, mm -hmm. which um, doesn't jive or seemed connected to homesteading mm -hmm. or or gardening. Mm -hmm. um, was there you you kept increasing this practice as I understand it, right? Yes. I mean the, the back by little, little by little. Eventually, you know, we had about a little less than a third of an acre lot in in the city. You know, we were just outside of the the heart of uptown Charlotte. Uh, not quite into suburbs, but not in like downtown, you know, high rise and right. in between. And by the time we sold the place, we had the backyard and all the front yards. Well, and we were those crazy people in the yeah. neighborhood. Naked we, kids in the back. Yeah, naked kids. You know, my son learned how to potty, <laughs> potty train in the grass in the front yard. You know? right. As it ought to be. What do you think the purpose of grass is? <laughs> Uh, all right. So this was, was it increasing? I, my question is what, was there something you were, you were just enjoying that or you were rebelling against sort of maybe the order of work that you experienced? Well, I would definitely rebel. Okay. Yeah. You were conscious that this was a different way of things. Yes. I think initially, no, I wasn't fully aware of that. 
um, but something inside of me was. And so I was gravitating more towards it. There was a time, you know, if I fast forward a little bit to the the yard and going all in on the yard, there was a period of time where we didn't have that. We were in an apartment for a couple of years and my outlets were otherwise. My outlets tended to take me away from the home and the family. This is that running problem. That was when I, I, I was addicted to running, <laughs> uh, trail running for a while. And not long after we had our first son and we were starting to look for houses, my wife said, you can't spend whatever it was, you know, hours and hours a week running. Uh, you need you need to find your your enjoyment and your satisfaction here at home. And that sounded great, but I, I still needed something physically to do. Yeah. I couldn't just sit and play with a toddler for 30 hours. A week. I'm going to pause really quick. And now that I'm Craig's neighbor, I see him. And uh, you you probably are listening he has a calm demeanor, and it's generally a calm guy. One time I heard him raise his voice just to get people's attention. And uh, <laughs> if you've ever seen a duck swim, it's it's very calm and peaceful on top. Underneath, those little legs are just going a million miles an hour. That's like Craig. So I could see you going from <laughs> running 30 hours a week to yeah. like, well, if I'm going to have a garden, I'm going to have a freaking garden. Yeah, garden. Um, all right. So you had, you had chickens. You were... Yeah, composting, and sure. Composting and bees and uh, fruit trees and fruit bushes and vegetable gardens. Comfrey plots. Yeah, er lots of herbs and medicinal okay. plants. And we started to get into, or Abby did in particular, get into lots of home remedies with herbs and mm -hmm. finding ways to use things that might otherwise be waste. Yeah. From uh, from the garden or byproducts of it's been things. interesting to me i don't know if you can confirm it but uh it's saying i think we've said this on other podcasts can't remember but the motivations for homesteading from a couple families mm -hmm. typically it seems that the father you know wants to work mm -hmm. and with and then hopefully with his family yep and that's his that's his gateway his entry in that the wife very often has care for the bodies of the body of yes. the family that they they have a, a tendency to think of things like whereas the dad's like i want how do you you know i need a more efficient way to split wood and she's like i wouldn't get rid of gmos you yeah, know a, a, a different they're, they're caring about the health yeah. yeah but it's that the, they kind of meet in the middle in mm -hmm. homesteading uh which is they yeah. definitely you can see the complementarity very clearly yeah yeah it seems that's where those things actually can meet up uh, all right so you guys were not meeting up uh, on the trail your not wife can't can't people. have babies and join you that's right. she had no interest in joining <laughs> yeah. why well, uh yeah my my children are somewhat interested in this long distance running you know mm -hmm. due, due to a uh acquaintance at our shared parish um and uh but i my wife and she's always is poking at me i, I use the john senior quote of you know if people would start gardening in their backyard they could stop the spectacle of jogging <laughs> Right. You could stop jogging if you would just turn the gardener and then you'd be growing food instead yeah, of just you know. double dig your garden beds. And <laughs> I'm not running. But uh, I'll let my son, if the sons are gaining some discipline, I guess we'll let them run. But they still have to milk the cows in the morning. Um, so I think in in that time where I first just kind of went all in on establishing backyard gardens and doing these things to fill time. I gradually saw more clearly that. I wasn't just filling time, but mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. doing productive work and it was productive work that actually closer to my family mm -hmm. and directly providing for them and myself, not just leaving for eight to 10 hours a day mm -hmm. or more uh, to sit in an office and a dollar show up in a bank account right. at the end of a pay period. And that was very satisfying for me to the work in the, the yard work in the yard yeah to to look at a patio covered in a couple hundred heads of garlic curing right and realizing wow we grew that mm -hmm. and now we don't have to buy garlic from the store mm -hmm. sure and we could afford whatever garlic we wanted from the store right and it wasn't it wasn't that it was that we were doing something that was tied directly to our needs 
our daily provisioning that brought us together instead of separating us right you know we have this most of us find ourselves in work conditions as family men that take us away mm -hmm. from our feelings right i think most of us wrestle with that yeah yeah i think it's a it's not comfortable that comes up regularly on the podcast on or i mean if you talk to any dad it's mm -hmm. not comfortable because we have to work mm -hmm. and we have to lead provide mentor and guide our family yeah. and when those things become in conflict yeah. it's uh you know we want to be doing kind of the same thing at the same time with the same act yeah um and i i agree i don't i don't make um my income primarily from farming mm -hmm. um but we do we do have a commercial dairy as you know because you get milk from it yes craig and i have a system by the way it's working out i'm going to declare it publicly i think it's legal is it prop no it's probably not no no what? no to trade services yeah so craig <laughs> craig has an open and oh, it's, it's illegal i'm sure uh craig has an open spigot uh over here at our place to get milk whenever he needs except a few times we run out and then and whenever a sharpened knife that's right and craig has a knife so <laughs> it's uh it's been very economical for me uh because for us uh one of the big burdens was you know getting our animals processed was a lot was a big production for us now you're set up and then but my kids can show up and help Although they, I think they threaten help more than actually help. Um, they need to get, Henry wanted to go do the deer for days, but he put it off. So I can tell you one of the the turning points. Yeah. Okay. Back, back to the yeah. story. Uh, turning points. Recognizing, I think, I think we should do more. I think we can do more than just the backyard, and that we might want to find a way to give up this lucrative banking work in the mm -hmm. city altogether. I was at one of these corporate town hall events, which okay. I, I always hated. You know, they, I, I loathed them with some deep loathing. <laughs> uh, loathed with deep loathing. Yes. Uh, but I, there was one in particular where the theme the whole time was life work balance, which really just meant how can you spend more time providing greater productivity to this corporation hmm. and boy so was the emphasis i would think the emphasis was they're recognizing mental health issues so maybe sure i mean in in words really okay but like not seriously as much, because, because was, their end was to yeah. make better employees to make more money. right so sure I'll, I'll recognize your mental health needs so that right. it wasn't really a care of the person <laughs> Okay, yeah. so maybe in defense, hold on. Okay, maybe in defense, to the town hall. no, 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 no. You know me better than that. I'm trying though. I'm I'm hearing the voices of friends in my back. I'm like, there are people that do care for people in the corporate world. Of course, but you're 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 I, saying I was, that, a, I was in management for a while, and yes, I I deeply care for them. But the, but the arch reality is these the 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 purpose of us being here is is not a direct economic. I mean, meaning communal thing. I mean, we're we're making money for this company, right. and okay, great. That's your yeah, job. You no you 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 have you have a job doing that. Um, but I recall, I if um, how did you 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 told me you actually got out of direct financial services? Yes. And maybe the realization. Oh, hold on. You, if you want to finish the town hall thing, finish that. But then I want you to go into the how you moved into replacing your the employees yeah. that you cared about. So finish the town hall. <laughs> Yes, the, so I I kept thinking in that town hall, I I don't want to have to balance mm -hmm. what I see as the important things in my life, my faith, my family, the work at home, with the demands of this work. But that that, that didn't seem like the right goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seemed like integration. That word came to me in that town hall. No, I, I want an integrated life. Mm -hmm. I don't want a balanced life. I don't life. want a balanced life. Yeah. Um, and I think even just calling it life work balance indicates that it's not integrated and it can't be mm -hmm. because the goal is finding a balance, not actually bringing these things together. Right. So we're going to have two separate ends of the scale. We're not going to take the things off the scale ends and put them together. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, I thought. I want to do that. I don't know how. I didn't know how. Still figuring that out. Yeah, it wasn't. I bet your children. I don't think it was bringing them to the office. 
No, no. I've done that. I did that once. <laughs> <laughs> All right, out so, of necessity. So at some point, the, the talent you changed in within the banking world. You yeah. Got I, I was getting burnt out on 200 households. Okay. I, I figured out a lot of my colleagues not getting burnt out were very good at not really caring about the people that they hmm. they worked with and managed money for. And I'm not saying that that's a that's a blanket occurrence. That I know lots of good financial planners that do care about their yeah. clients. In the environment that I worked in, there were constant changes in goalposts, increased quotas. So who I had to care about kept growing. Mm -hmm. And I found myself kind of hitting a limit that I couldn't emotionally mm -hmm. invest myself in 200 plus families mm -hmm. and still go home and want to be in conversation with my wife. Yeah. I remember times I get home, I spent, you know, 10 hours in conversation with other people. And I get yeah. home, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm sorry, Abby. I, I know, but then like, you, I am burnt out. So, but then you're, so you guys have kids. Yeah. So she's at home all day with people incapable of, uh, capable of conversation. Right. And then I've had that experience. I come yeah. home, I'm on the phone. Hey, we're doing this podcast. Right. You know, you're doing these things all day and you get home and it's, no, I don't want to talk. Right. You under you have a sort of I well, you have a sympathy for it. Could we just veg out and watch TV? Right. Right. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. we didn't know on a television, but there were times where I thought I get that. I would do yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that works together. Yeah. I see. I mean, I think in my in my family, we we did we all went off, you know, to school to work, and we came home. We watched TV together. That mm -hmm. was the family activity. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so uh, you got burned out on that, so you switched. So I switched. I started working in a kind of a back office regulatory compliance job. Or it wasn't really just regulatory compliance, so, so. but a little bit. Um, I was doing more data analytics and doing some database management stuff so that we could report on regulatory compliance. Okay. All right, so we need to wrap up the boring part of this, which boring, is banking. But but the, so you but tell me the but story. I, I, end, I ended to, to wrap that part up. All right. so moved out of this regulatory compliance reporting stuff into um, more of a, a true IT role where I was developing uh, digital robots to replace uh, attorneys and bankers okay. at the bank. So you were replacing your uh, colleagues. Replacing yeah, okay. colleagues. All right, so I you, didn't like that. So you reached the height of the evil corporate empire. I did. Uh, I got to the peak where I was not. You were done. Next, the robots were going to replace me. Yeah. Yeah, they were coming for you. Okay. Um, so this was the point you were experiencing the homestead you're on this i guess upward mobility of the job that you kind of fell into out of college was sure. it some kind of passion yeah, stumbled into it um made it work because it seems even strange to me knowing you knowing the depth of your thought um i think you know in case anyone over romanticized craig's been across the street for a year full time two years around yeah i guess we what did we we moved into that place one year ago. Yeah. So we're both About still, we're both still busy as dads. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the few interactions we get to have depth of thought, it's like, oh, this is refreshing. Um, so it's surprising to hear uh, as you sit next to me covered in blood with your flannel and your hat. Yeah. Um, so you, you guys were probably wide open doing what a lot of people do, which is looking for opportunities, doing spreadsheets of potential businesses. Yeah. Um, and just to tell the story, well, a, a side story, Craig, had, when he was opening his butcher shop, I did him the uh, unsolicited favor of writing a press release, uh, which then Where alert. Where you married my wife. Oh, yes. In the press release, they thought I didn't know my or his name. Uh, so I, I submitted it as Jason Craig about Craig and Abby Tafaro. Uh, and uh, they thought I had made a mistake and said, Jason Craig and his wife, Abby Tafaro. Which Abby's comment was, uh, oh, I'm one of those women that won't take your last name. <laughs> Our polygamous cult here. I took on another wife here. Um, in that, so I submitted that. That made a little bit of a kerfuffle, if that's how that's pronounced. Sure. Uh, with uh, zoning. And uh, we won't go into the, maybe another podcast on the details. But uh, I said at that meeting, we went and a lot of the community vouched for you. And I was there. Uh, I said that. Most people, when they go to a zoning meeting, it is someone from the outside who's moved there who wants to do something new, some new business, some new enterprise. And they would like permission to alter the state 
in the in the reality of that place right. you know because a lot of people might feel bad about it don't tell me what to do with my land but right. in reality most zoning especially in rural situations at least is i would like to convert something that was rural you know agrarian or homesteading or, mm -hmm. or just land to something commercial or enterprise right. or 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 maybe uh, hospitality um usually it is i would like to alter this place mm -hmm. whereas at that meeting my point to that board was that you actually um were invited to that place to to maintain something that was already there in some ways and to continue to actually fill a need that we had so the background for listeners is that craig asked me when i said the land was available he saw the land first and then he thought well what what and he asked me what could we do what's needed around there and uh i said right away i don't know if this was it this was before covid yep. okay uh i said we need a butcher because as a homesteader and farmer, I can tell you all of us farmers around here, um, you know, we had appointments at uh, meat processing facilities for animals we didn't own yet. Mm -hmm. That's how, I mean, they were just growing, consolidating. So the work is not the same as it was 10 years ago when I first brought my first uh, Charlie the Charbroiled Charlay yeah. um, in our first uh, steer we raised. Um, and so you asked me and I said, it's a butcher shop. So that's what I said in that zoning meeting. We needed that. When, uh, what, what was the progression of you, you were at home and you were just hunting potential enterprises. You were looking at potential places. Yeah, we had, we had casually looked for other land to move out of, outside of the city near Charlotte mm -hmm. and, and in a, uh, around Charlotte, we had looked on the East side, we looked North, we had looked South and South Carolina, a little bit West. Um, but we had it until we you helped us find this place and we started to talk about ideas of what this community needed we hadn't really pursued seriously any ideas of enterprises on those properties that we had looked at casually you would have been commuting we would have been commut i would have been commuting into the city okay so or, that's a big jump to go from homesteading with a commute which is the more common mm -hmm. perhaps a recommended mm -hmm. um method for people right you, you but you went full in yes as we looked at those other properties this is over maybe the two-year period or so we it never quite seemed right i know that might sound squishy or something but it yeah you know, we would consider the facts in front of us we'd think through uh family issues relationships and just say that that the why mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of times what would come up is the move to the land would have mattered around our parish mm -hmm. in the city and it would mean more time away for me from family mm -hmm. because of the commute probably less time available to do the things we really wanted to do right um yeah that's interesting and, and just it seemed presumptive in some way for us to think well we can just go buy land and plant ourselves in whatever community we want and farm it it is presumptive right yeah. it yeah. is and and so when you recommended considering this land suddenly things made a little more sense because you were here. I knew you. I knew some others through uh, now shared parish. Mm -hmm. um, the community maybe had a way to welcome us. We weren't just going to plant and say we're here. Right now, buy the things we want you to buy. That's from right. us. Here's know? my boutique honey. That's right. Um, and so that changed our considerations quite a bit. Right to, to have a connection to you as an immediate neighbor. Um, and to have you recommend to us an actual need in the community. So, and what I've seen, I mean, you've, I don't know how many of my animals you've killed. Um, fair number. Fair number. Okay. But um, that, that's, a, it's an interesting thing that, um, you know, Robert Nisbet talks about, and I repeat this, and it's just community is formed by solving problems together. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean people are problems that need to be solved. That's the wrong interpretation of that. Um, <laughs> but it's that, men particularly do much better for you know a lot of the the community formation the, the talk of community is based all on uh intentionality mm -hmm. and shared interests mm -hmm. um which 
to me, honestly, does not sound like love your neighbor at all. Mm-hmm. It sounds like our modern sounds obsession. Like I'm going to find my tribe. I'm going to find my tribe and I'm going to, I'm going to make it work or I'm going to find people that fill this void. I feel within me mm-hmm. uh, versus I'm going to love the people close to me. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, pause. Um, but there is the way community ha- has been formed. Actually, I mean, if we look at, at the guilds of Christendom and, and the is is recognizing mutual need, and that can be spiritual, right? Which is right. Uh, Mark Barnes of New Polity bring he, he mentioned one time to me it was fascinating that the reason the medieval guilds were obsessed with like their craft and purgatory was that purgatory they recognized was the time in their life where they will need their community completely because mm-hmm. they're incapable of helping themselves. Right. So they will be they need those prayers. So don't you forget to light that freaking candle, right? Every Thursday yeah, yeah. for me forever. Um, but also with their craft, because we need someone who's good at making candles and bread and, yeah. and, and et cetera. Um, so what's been your experience of sort of, you know, you had a, a, a decent community in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Maybe you were, um, distancing because your way of life was tending towards homesteading, yes. um, and, and a home-based economic reality. Um, you're here, but and you're cultivating, you're new, you're new, which I appreciate. A lot of people, if you're, they think I'm going to show up, I'm going to buy my way in Mm -hmm. to a community and then I'm going to grow whatever I want. Um, and people are going to, you know, it's just, and there's a lot of failure with that model, but you're at, you've, you know, I had to pull you away from uh, someone's steer over there. Someone I don't even know. What's it been like cultivating in a new community through a service rendered to them? It's wonderful. All right. Uh, so, uh, in the boring part of the story, as you call it, <laughs> boring <laughs> bank part. Uh, did I look interested did, on the webcam? I was did, trying. Did I, to... did I have friends in some in some capacity at work? Yes. Did I have friends through my parish? Yes. Um, did I truly share in any economic reality and real communal reality with like a shared people? love for a like a common love? Right. Yeah. Not really. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, um, the most would be in in the the spiritual reality of my friends in my parish. You know, right. that, that shared reality of praying bearing with one another um but what has been striking to me here and like i said wonderful is in what seems like a relatively short amount of time i've gone from not knowing more than a handful of people to know people Mm -hmm. and and getting to know them somewhat intimately because i'm killing their animals and preparing meat that they're going to eat. Right. Yeah. I did. So they have so a story with that they animal. Have a story showing. with that animal. I learn about their eating habits. How do they want their meat cut, and why? What do they cook? You know what their family traditions. Um, people who come from different ethnic backgrounds want to share with me traditions from their home countries or their family's mm-hmm. home countries. It it's been a really delightful experience in a way that. I casually knew my neighbors in the city, but they weren't really interested as much as I was in getting to know them. You know, right. I, so I could be pushy and try and have conversation, but really they wanted to pull in the driveway and go inside. Mm-hmm. Um, here, you, I think, what's your phrase that farming around here is a spectator? Sport? Yeah. Yeah. So imagine uh, it, farming is a spectator sport start slaughtering animals on, <laughs> on the hilltop between three roads uh, across from the church yes, by the way across from the church uh not our church is people little... notice yeah and and they want to stop by and see what's going on and um i've tended to have this experience in life i don't know exactly why um but strangers tend to just tell me their life stories and you know at a two minute interaction. It's Craig's subtle smile. It's his subtle smile. He's it's because he got good at faking listening when That's he got right. home from talking to two hundred feet. Uh so I, you know people just drive by and pull in and and then I find out 
I don't know, the the history of the little farm two miles down the road and how my daddy did this and he don't like it when other people do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and suddenly I, I, I realized this week I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm amassing a nice little collection of stories and characters. No, I, I remember, um, when we moved here, we, or actually, so the, we, you know, we first, we moved to this area, we were bartering for where we lived. Then we bought a three acre homestead mm-hmm. and um, we were putting up a fence and, you know, we were right on the road. So we're, people are spec, you know, they're spectating on what we're doing. And around here, if, if you don't know what you don't know, but to the listeners, it's a, a growing equestrian area. So most of the people actually are coming here to retire with, with horses more expensive than my home. Mm-hmm. And um, so we put up a fence and then we put out a Jersey cow. Uh, Abigail, who you have milked. Um, yes. Abigail went out in that front pasture in the front yard, and all of a sudden, people uh, started stopping by, mm-hmm. and they said, "I remember when we all." Mm-hmm. And then we would ha- we'd hang a pig. Uh, the, our hanging tree, tree. Well, it, our hanging tree in that at that farm was um, pig hanging, pig hanging, <laughs> pig hanging tree. Uh, at that farm was um, in the front yard, right by the road. Oh, nice. So I just told the kids, "We hang, we hang pigs in the front yard as a as a warning to anyone. This is why we don't have to lock our doors." And um, people stopped by and we had these old, one of these old timers stopped by and with tears in his eyes, he was telling me about, he wanted to come help us butcher a pig because he had forgotten mm-hmm. how to do it. And it was such a part of their life. And then um, he explained on, on our on our farm, he was telling us that this little shack that we had, that we had rabbits in, mm-hmm. uh, how it was the smokehouse for this whole little community. And they used wow. to smoke their hams in there and then bring them to Spartanburg. Mm-hmm. Um, and so your experience, I can echo your experience that doing something for and with other people mm-hmm. is the fastest way to communicate. And the, the reason, and not, not as if it's a shortcut, it's just, it's, a, it's organic. Right. Uh, and the reason I bring it up is, I, I don't know if you experienced this, but when I moved, because uh, I'm from North Carolina, we're back here, but I was living in Denver, Colorado when we had our agrarian conversion. And good friends of the church were accusing us of retreating from community life oh, yeah, to live to live isolated on our homestead mm-hmm. and my experience has been the only place you can truly be isolated is in neighborhoods where everyone has their their ties together are only by effort yep. that they have no economics or service based bonds they get together because it's good to be with people but not because they need them yep. um my experience has been actually the homesteading and and for me a, a rural life has not f- well maybe forced community is one word uh you know when we, you and i have to explain to gabino why the pigs that kind of belong to us but we're actually at shannon's house knocked right. over his trash and rum- did your dogs rummage through my trash no it's my pigs but those were shannon's pigs well they're at shannon's but they're mine and craig's uh anyway that's another another podcast story um but has that been so you said yes you experienced that charge in the literally the opposite reality oh yeah for sure um sitting across the street from the church has been interesting as well wait i should clarify that's not our parish it's not our parish yeah unfortunately maybe one day but the pastor's name is craig so i'm jason craig across the street is craig tafar and then there's another craig pastor craig across the street all right but anyway the church across the street they've they're they've welcomed us they're supportive that there's a slaughterhouse across the street from their church Uh, we don't operate on sundays so there's very little conflict Right, uh, but I've had a number of those uh, church members stop by and tell me stories about different structures that were on our property, mm-hmm. uh, or times that they lived on our property because the the old farmhouse that we had to tear down that was originally built by the first pastor, yeah, the founding the church, pastor, the founding pastor. He granted the land for the church paid for it to be built and he was the pastor wow and so that there's just entering into the historical reality of a place the living reality of a place has been i mean more than probably what i expected Mm -hmm. um i never i my work in the past separated me from any local community reality that I would get on the computer and the phone and I'd work with people in New York and California and mm-hmm. um, 
Asia and India, you know, all over the place, um, and didn't have any means by which to connect with those who lived next to me. Right. Other than effort. Other than effort. Yeah. And I tried to make that effort. Just, yeah. Um, but. All right. Well, we're yeah. uh, so you don't know this, but we've gone over what the time we should have been. Okay. Don't worry. Apparently in podcasting, you do whatever you want. OK. Um, but I think we'll ha we need to come back because um, perhaps giving people overly romanticized. We should talk about the hard stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was just thinking. I took your farm. <laughs> Craig took <laughs> took the valley. Yes. And now people drive. Yeah, we have a tunnel connecting our land. Craig, Craig was my duke my baron and duke until he kicked the peasantry off of the their homestead um yeah we'll tell that story but, but uh also as you're sitting here talking like yeah working together i'm like maybe we should get some more pigs over at shannon's that we have to go get yeah. get to see each other um but no i think uh i think i'd like to have you back specifically i think you, what you brought up is um the, a fundamental difference in our economic arrangements that when our work and isn't is not a place of our family mm -hmm. and then our families are also not places of work mm -hmm. the challenges that come with that and i don't i want to be careful on the podcast to not uh we can point these things out without recommending that everyone do what we have done definitely um and without because there are a lot of people and i i more are, the more i do that it's I it's not because um i'm not happy to have done i'm very happy to have done it but that it's it's a bigger conversion than a lot of people realize so uh We'll we'll talk uh, on a future podcast. Like I knew Craig was going to make it when he made head cheese uh, from a pig that we killed at my farm. So um, this has been uh, Till and Keep podcast. Craig, thank you for uh, being on it. We'll we'll come back to this. Thank you, Jason. This episode of Till and Keep has been brought to you by Tan Fraternus and Sword and Spade. Till and Keep is a podcast that shows how the primordial command from God to Adam to till and keep the garden applies whether you toil on a farm or in a concrete jungle. Visit tillandkeeppodcast.com to subscribe and follow the show. And use coupon code TILL25 to get 25% off your next order at tanbooks.com.